Okay. So first thing I want to talk about today is magnetic materials, right? And I, I don't like to get too lost in this, but there's magnetic materials are, are weird um, in that unlike a capacitor, which tends to be linear, these guys tend to be a little bit more nonlinear. If I say nonlinear, what that means is you guys know, if I say I have a B field, right? How does that relate to the H field? U times H. Problem is that that doesn't work all that well, all right? And that's the thing. This this works over a range, but it kind of breaks down, and there's all kinds of implications on on what that means. Okay. All right. So before I go through that, I wanted to just review real quick because magnetic circuits. A lot of you guys have seen that in fields. All right. So we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it. It's a fairly simple concept. All right. So what we kind of defined the other day is if I have a bar of magnetic material, right? If I say I have a magnetic circuit, I'm not talking about an inductor. An inductor, like the L with an I going into it and a voltage across it, that's not the magnetic circuit. That's an electric circuit. And it's a model for the, for the magnetic thing. The magnetic circuit is basically saying that there is a source of MMF, okay? So when I say MMF, that's basically this guy, all right? Ni equals H times L. And then I have a flux going through the circuit. And if I have a magnetic material, that magnetic material is basically got a reluctance, which is defined as L, the length over mu times A. Okay. So basically in this analogy, right? So we can basically sort of summarize this. In the electric circuit world, all right, what's the energy source? Well, most real energy sources that you have are voltage sources, batteries, generators, whatever, right? I get a battery, it causes a flow, causes a charge to flow, call that a current, right? And there's a resistance. In a magnetic circuit, we have an MMF source, a magnetomotive force, right? It makes magnetic fields move, okay? What moves is the flux and the reluctance is the, uh, the reluctance of uh, to, to resist the flow of that flux, okay? So if you notice the formula for the resistance, which you probably don't remember the resistance formula all that well, but basically it kind of makes sense, right? The length divided by the area times the conductivity, right? So what's that say? If I had a, a, a wire, right? What's the resistance of a wire? What's supposed to be the resistance of Resistance of a wire should be zero. Yeah, it should be really small. Why is that based on that equation? Like the resistance here is L over sigma A. Conductivity is very large, right? So if I have a core, all right, so I'll take a, a core, um, I'll take a breath for myself. We're going to talk about some of the magnetic materials. This guy here is, is um, iron powder is what I call this, this toroid. Okay. That doesn't mean that all toroids are iron powder. It just means this toroid is iron powder. You can get different kinds. All right. But this, this guy right here, if I just think about this, this is an ungapped core, right? I don't have a gap in it or anything like that. Right. So I, if, if you think about this, this is the, this guy has a reluctance in, in the context of, of a, of an electric circuit, the wire is got an, a, a resistance that's basically really small. What is this core like in most situations? This core in a magnetic circuit should be just like a wire, okay? What's the job of a wire? To direct the electricity, to make sure the electrons go from that source into that resistor where they do work, okay? So in the case of, of one of these, typically what I'm trying to do is to move the, the flux to where it's gonna be useful to me, all right? So we talk about that a little bit more in a, in a second. And you actually have a problem like that, I think problem two, which kind of gets at that on the, on the homework, right? So a couple of things to remember there. That means that circuits is very simple. It becomes hard only because there's plus signs and minus signs and all that kind of stuff that screws you guys up. And then there's meshes and nodes. And, but there's basically just three things to it, right? There's Ohm's law, KCL, and KVL. So Ohm's law here is to say that the MMF is equal to phi, the flux, times the reluctance, okay? Now, KCL 
basically says that the sum of the fluxes into a node is zero. KVL says the sum of the MMFs around the loop is zero. All right, basically saying I sum up the voltages, I sum up the currents, okay? It's a fairly simple process. Now you never, you, you, you don't, we don't talk about this as much because these aren't as important probably to, to just every everyday life maybe what they are, but not as maybe as such as, as electric circuits. The thing about this, as we're going to talk about, is how much charge leaks out of the wires and doesn't go into the resistor. If I talk about this, this picture right here, right, how much of the charge goes through the air? Pretty much none. Not none. There's, there's some. It's just pretty darn small. Right? It's picoamps or something, right? That's not the case here. Some of it's going to, quote unquote, leak out. All right, and the reason for that is over here, sigma for copper. Any idea what the what the value of that is for copper? It's like ten to the twelve. All right, the mu over here is is like you know ten to the fourth times mu naught. All right, so it's in other words, this guy is 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 effectively like twelve orders of magnitude bigger than the conductivity of I guess I'll call it air. All right. And whereas this guy is only a couple of orders of magnitude bigger, which means that the leakage is going to matter more. Okay, we're going to get into that a little bit more as we go, but I'm not going to focus there yet. For now, I'm going to say most of our materials are essentially ideal, which means that I'm going to usually try to assume that my mu is close to infinite. Okay, all right. Now, so let's say I had, this is sort of a typical inductor what I have here where I have an air gap. All right, in other words, when we design inductors, usually we design them to have an air gap like this. All right, now this is the C core. We don't typically see C cores, but we actually see much more so or something like what I gave you in the homework there where you had an E core, all right? Now I say an E core, basically it looks like the letter E, right? So it looks like this. Except that doesn't make an inductor, right? Because that's just what? Well, so it's a magnetic core, but it's, a, it's only half of one, right? Magnetic fields are always closed, right? So I have to put another E core basically on top of this guy. And then I have to somehow push them together. So usually there's a screw or a, a tape or something that holds them together, okay? So a typical picture might be something like this guy right here, which I can come back to it. But this is what I would call a pot core, right? Because it looks like a, they have all kinds of funny names, right? They look like letters or pots, all right? This guy basically looks like, like a pot that has a top and a bottom, right? And what I have in the middle of it is essentially what we call a bobbin. And we, we put our windings around the bobbin, okay? Um, and usually these guys come gapped, okay? So in other words, I can go and I can get, so I gave you an example of Ferrick's cube, I think was what I gave you in the homework and, and problem two, right? So they will sell it to you with a particular gap size in it, all right, to get a particular inductance. Now, why would that be? All right, so let's look at this guy here. Let's look at my C core. All right, let's make a magnetic circuit model for this guy. What's my model? What's the source of, of magnetic fields here? It, N times I, right? So my I have an MMF source. I draw that as a voltage source, N times I. Okay. And then how many reluctances do I have in this guy? Two. All right. I mean, I guess I could start, you know, breaking up the, the core into different pieces. But typically the way we think about this from a practical perspective is that there is the reluctance of the core and the reluctance of the gap. Okay. Now, chances are you guys didn't look too carefully. And we're doing the homework. You just put the numbers in and didn't look at them too carefully, right? But if I look at this, reluctance of the core and reluctance of the gap, I got two in series there, right? So how do I calculate the reluctance of the core here? Yeah, the length, yeah, the length over mu times the cross-sectional area. So here that's A sub C, okay? And we call it the length LM, okay? Now that gap, 
What's what would I do for that guy? All right, so LM, and I'd be careful, this guy's got a mu relative times mu naught times the area of the core like that. All right, now, I look at this. In, in the homework, this mu R, I said, is typically on the order of, you know, 1,000 to, you know, I don't know, 5,000, something like that. All right. So what's true about the reluctance of the core relative to the reluctance of the gap? It's smaller, and in fact, typically, it's it's RG is much much. Well, yeah, typically the gap has a much much higher reluctance than the reluctance of the core. All right now, where's the difference coming from? Well, the length is longer here, right? The gap is small, right? So typically, G is the length of the gap is typically much much smaller than the length of the core. Right, their areas they're same, but what's the other thing that's different here? Permeability. With permeability, permittivity is a, is is a dielectric thing. Yeah, makes sense. Perm permeability here, all right, is much much bigger for the core. So that means that effectively, this guy here is like a magnetic version of a wire. Oftentimes, right? What's his job in life? His job is to direct the flux to where it's useful. Where is the flux useful? It's useful in the gap. All right. That's just just like, and that's, I tried to show that. We're going to do that again probably on Monday when next time I'm in here live where I try to take, if I take two coils that were identical and put them on top of each other, you guys know if I put a voltage on one coil and I have another coil near it, that's a transformer, right? If the number of turns is the same, what do you expect the voltage is going to be on the secondary? The same, all right? Without a core, that won't happen, all right? The reason it won't happen is because I haven't directed the flux to go exactly where I want it to do, right? The job of this magnetic material is basically to make sure the flux goes where it's useful, all right? That's, that's its primary job in life. And so the other thing that, that's true about this guy too is the mu here is really hard to control. And so I, I put data, this is actually the data for that same material I gave you in the problem to 3C90 material, all right? One of the things you see here, they, they tell you mu sub i, it tells you at a particular temperature and a particular frequency in a particular B field that its value is 2300 plus or minus 20%, which is a pretty big variation, all right? So it, it's, it's a real big variation, but if... If it's the case that RG is much, much bigger than RC, I can control the gap a lot easier than I can control the mu, right? Because what do I know about air? What do I know about the mu of air? It's constant. It's 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. The universe set that and moved on, okay? The thing that's also really easy to control is the length of the gap, right? I can do very nice machining in a shop and I can get, I can control pretty carefully what the length of that gap is. All right, machining processes are easy to control. Mu values are not, all right? They're very heavily dependent on chemical stuff. All right, so basically it allows me to make a really well-defined inductor typically if it has a gap in it, okay? And that's one of the reasons why we do it, all right? So again, you know, people always kind of ask, like, why do we have these U's and C's and E's and things like that? Well, they're just handy shapes to be able to make real inductors, all right? And the goal of that magnetic material is basically to direct the flux to where it's useful, which is typically inside of an air gap, okay? There's a couple other things that we got to think about on that, all right? And one of them is that these magnetic materials, what makes them special is what's going on inside of them, all right? Now, you may have seen this before, and it used to be there was a time in the past when you guys would, in one of the labs, did you measure a BH curve in one of the labs? Okay. There was a time when I first got here when people would, they would do that, and there was, there was some weird stuff in the labs. Um, the people did stopwatches, they did some weird things. But, but you may have seen that picture before right there, that picture on the, on the uh, right side which is the BH relationship for a real magnetic material. This is what you guys, B equals mu H, right? 
That's that's what you guys know. B equals mu h. This is what I would have if I had just a regular free free space, right? So air. This guy on the right is what you have for a real magnetic core. All right. Now, what we we say this guy has hysteresis. What the heck does hysteresis mean? Not quite. That's not, that's not quite how I would refer to it. So I think it was, the simplest example I can think of of hysteresis is let's say I'm trying to control the temperature in a room to 70 degrees. Okay. So what's your, how's your air conditioner work, right? It doesn't, it just turns on and off, right? So what's it have? It has what we call a hysteresis band. Basically it, it has a, it has a value below 70 degrees where the air conditioner turns off and a value above it where it turns on. But so it doesn't try to do it right at the point, all right? So, so basically what this means is, is, is usually what that says is that the turn on and turn off is path dependent. So basically what this says is, is the H field increases and then decreases. The B field is actually different, all right? So it's when, as H is going up, what would cause H to go up in a real inductor? So if I had an inductor that I wound around this core, what would cause the H field to go up? What physically do I have to do to the inductor to make, make the H field go up? Well, this is where it gets tricky, right? What What's my source of H field? The windings. And what do I have to put into the windings to get an H field? A current. So I put a current into the windings. That creates an H field, right? As that current increases, right, the H field increases, and so does the B field. And we said that for, for, for certain values, like let's say in this range right here, B equals mu H. Now, there is also this effect up here. By the time I get, by the time my H field gets to be big enough, what's this, what's this mean right here? The fact that this curve splits open kind of messes people up. So I'm going to skip it ahead a second and I'm going to go back. Sometimes we, we basically, we make the model that I have right here. All right. Where I basically say my B field is in this range, B equals mu times H, like that. But at a certain point, if I keep it, so this is my H on this axis. If I cre keep increasing my H field, what happens by the time my H field gets to say right here? What happens if my H field gets to there? Does B equal mu times H at that point? No, it's a constant. And what we do is we say that the material is saturated. So it's, I'm putting more H field in, but I'm not getting any more B field. All right. So what's going on, what makes the magnetic material special is this. If I took, if I looked inside at this guy, at sort of the atomic level, all right, I don't want to get into to too much stuff about that, but inside this guy, what I would see is basically the, the atoms, the crystalline structure of this thing would look kind of like this, where each of these guys at the atomic level looks like a, we call them domains, but these are basically little um, magnetic dipoles. All right, so you might've heard that in fields. What's a magnetic dipole? Well, if I have two sort of, if I have atoms together, right? I basically have North poles and South poles and I have fields that, that go between them. So inside of this guy, at a crystalline level, right? There's all these little magnetic domains that just look like little magnets. So my, when my arrow is pointing this direction, that means I have a field going in the direction of that arrow. So this one, it's going from what, left to right. This one's going down into the left. This one's going up into the, to the left. This guy's pointing straight up, right? So this is sort of all over the place, right? This guy is going into the page. This guy is coming out at me. I've got all kinds of different arrangements there for this. So <clears throat> what happens is this is what it looks like at this level, deep down inside of this thing. If I, if I put some windings around this thing, 
So let's say I had windings. Let's say let's say this was the inside of a core that looked like this, and I had windings going around it like that. Okay, and I put a current I like that. Where would my B field be or my H field be? Yeah, it'd be going around. You might right hand rule to say it's going to be going this direction, right? So this is basically a cross section of this material. So basically we have an H field going that direction, all right? Now, what's gonna happen if I put a magnet into a magnetic field? It's gonna, the, those little magnets are gonna try to align with the magnetic field. Now, by, by nature, they're just kind of randomly aligned, all right? They look like what they do here. But as I, if I put an H field in there and I keep increasing that H field, what happens is they start to align with the H field. So over time, they'll start to look like this. So if you look at this picture here, right, those arrows are kind of now sort of aligning with the direction of the H field I said that I was applying like this, right? So this was the starting point. This is where it gets to. Now, eventually, once I get to the point where they all point in the same direction, this guy's lost his special ability as a magnetic material at that point, right? As I increase H, the B field basically increases more than it should if this was free space, right? So that, that's what gives me the fact that B equals mu R times mu naught times H. Once I get to the point where they're all aligned, basically I'm at a point where I say the material is saturated. It can't do anything special for me at that point, all right? So, this, so it's not all that important that you guys have a deep understanding of what's happening at the, at the microscopic level on here. The important thing is what's going on inside this material? What does that mean? So when I first applied, so initially I started out like this, right? So everything's kind of randomly aligned, all right? What's happening? Well, as I increase the H field at some point, basically mu relative becomes equal to one, all right? That kind of means that the mu is a function of the current that I apply to this thing. That's what that means, all right? And we're gonna see, see how that all kind of plays out for a second. What does that also mean about these little magnetic domains, these little atoms inside here? So I start out, no field applied, right? No external field applied. And they're all kind of randomly oriented. Once I apply a field, they line up with it. Once the field's big enough, at least. What does that mean is going on inside this guy? Those are atoms down at that level, right? So there's motion happening inside of this thing. All right. You ever walk by a 60 hertz transformer? It's What's it doing? It's going at about 60 hertz, actually about 120 hertz That is what you hear. There's basically, there's motion inside of that thing. All right which if you touch it, it's hot as well, right? Because basically these little domains are just moving around inside of this thing. There's some other factors or something called magnetostriction, which is going on there. The, the, the materials, just all sorts of motion is happening inside of the material, all right? So that's important. What does that, what does that mean also has to be happening inside of that thing? If there's motion, there's got to be what? Work. In other words, there's got to be losses inside there. There's heat being generated inside of that thing. All right, so there's there's losses and there's this, there's other things. So the first thing I want to focus on is the idea of saturation, which is to say if my B field gets to be too big, the device begins to look like air. All right, the fact that these magnetic domains are inside of this thing basically gives this guy sort of a magnetic boost up to a certain level. Once they're all aligned like this, that boost factor is lost. All right, so he only looks like a good magnetic material in a certain range. And so what I marked out here was B sat. So what I call the saturation flux density. All right, and you have this on problem two of the assignment, right? So typical B sats for different materials are these ones here. So I say typical, right? Like I said, there's some variation in these things, but um, what, what I have on the top one here is 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 T, what's a T? Tesla, right? So 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 Tesla, that's a ferrite material that, that has that peak value. That would be um, something like what I have. 
something like this pot cord here typically that I showed, that's typically a ferrite material. Actually, the one that I gave you in the homework, problem two is a ferrite material. I think it, what did I say? It was like 200 or 300 Tesla, millitesla, something like that. Um, I think is the maximum I gave you in that problem. Um, this guy here, I said was powdered iron. Um, and then iron laminations, that's what you would use for a 60 Hertz transformer, all right, is, is iron lamination. So we're going to see what a lamination means here in a little bit. All right. Now, the important thing is, and this relates to, say, problem three on your homework. These are peak values. Okay. And we're going to see what that means here in a second. All right. So I want to just think about the practical meaning of this saturation here. So this is our material, right? So we've got this this and this device right here. Again, help me out. What's the magnetic circuit model for this thing? I got an MMF source. What's that? What's that? No, no gaps. So this guy's just NI. Yeah, reluctance of the core, which if I define this and there's going to be a flux phi, that guy's going to be what over what here? All right, so it's going to be, well, the reluctance of the core. L over mu, and I wrote this LM, mu R, mu naught times the area of the core. All right, now, we kind of showed this last time. Remember, I get phi equals Ni divided by the reluctance, right? That's the flux going through this thing. We also said we defined something called the flux linkage. What is that? Lambda. Well, what is it? It's phi times n. Exact said just like an engineer, it's phi times n. What would a physics guy say? He might say phi times n too. I don't know. But but the the basically one turn, each turn has a flux phi. But I can think of those as basically n inductors in series with each other. So the flux linking the whole thing is basically the sum of it. So if they all have the same flux, it's n times phi. So this guy becomes n phi, which we write as n squared i over the reluctance of the core. And we define from this the inductance. We said lambda equals what? L times i. And we said that L basically is always n squared over the reluctance. Okay. And I always like to look at it that way. It's helpful to me. All right. Let's think about this though for a second. All of that assumes that what range am I in on this, on this BH curve, the linear range. It assumes that I'm basically between here and here. This is the H line. All right. Now the H, remember, is Ni times the length of the core. So the current and the H field are directly related to each other, okay? Now, I just wanna think this through for a second. What happens if I reach the saturation point? What happens if I reach here? If I reach the saturation point, if, my, if I keep increasing my I, so I increase I, increase I, and eventually the B field inside the inside here. And how do I figure out the B field inside of this thing? Based on my magnetic circuit model, how can I figure out the B field? Well, yep. Yeah, basically B times A. Right? So at some point, once my B gets to be this, the saturation flux density, okay? What's going to happen? Well, basically, at that point, my mu is going to drop. And effectively, once I saturate, my mu is equal to mu naught. Okay. What's that going to do to my reluctance? So if my mu drops, what happens to my reluctance of the core? It increases. What's that do to my L? L decreases. That means the L is a function of the current. <clears throat> now, you don't think of that for a capacitor, right? A capacitor, you put a voltage on it. For the most part, you never have to worry about this. But for almost any real inductor, this is a problem, all right? 
is the fact that this material, if I, if I push it to saturation, its inductance begins to change. All right, so what, what practical effect does this have? So, so it has a practical effect. And one of the things I did, so here's, here's a good way to get an inductor, right? So what is this? Hopefully you've seen this before. It's a 24 volt doorbell transformer. You can go to your favorite Lowe's or Home Depot and get plenty of these, right? It's for doorbells. You used to have power supplies that had these. You, you don't have any power supplies that have one of these anymore. All right, but, but you used to get these. All right, so inside this guy, so this is, first of all, which one's the primary, which one's the secondary? Everybody know? Yeah, row one. This, this is the primary. The, this is the secondary with the three wires. Okay, and I'll explain why that is later. But this is the primary side, all right? That's where I put the 120 volts. <clears throat> now, typically, this is the way I like to think about it. So, so if, I, and I, if I do this and I hook this guy up, all right, what does the current and everything look like because of the saturation? So we typically talk about hooking up our inductors to an AC excitation. Why? Because the grid is 120 volt source, as, as far as you're concerned, right? Those outlets are 120 volt sources and they're voltage sources. All right, so when I hook up an inductor like this doorbell transformer, right? So like this guy or like a motor, right? Basically I'm hooking that thing up like so. All right, so that imposes what onto this thing? So in terms of, if I have my inductor like this guy right here and I hook it up to a voltage source. So in the electrical world, this is V of T like that. All right, I put a voltage source onto that thing and I put a 60 Hertz voltage source. And let's say my V of T is this guy here. So my V of T is just, um, how am I gonna write this? If this is 120 volts, how do I write V of T? Not, not almost 120 times cosine. Square root of two, then the cosine, right? So 120 times the square root of two, because I if I'm writing it in the time domain, I need the peak value. So this would be cosine omega T like that. Okay, so here's V of T. Now that causes a current to flow here, I of T. All right, now it also causes a flux inside the core. Okay, how can I figure out the flux on this thing? What's the relationship? Well, you guys know if I put a voltage source, if I asked you if, if you if you had taken this class and, and you were in Yahoo's class in 2112, I put a V of T across an inductor. How would you solve for that? LDIDT, right? Or J omega L, right? Times I. So basically, if I move this into the phasor domain, I have V equals J omega L. Let me write it this way for a second. V of T equals L di dt. What's the other way I can write that? Well, if in steady state, I can definitely make that d by dt into a j omega, right? I can also say lambda equals li. So how can else can I write this? This is basically just Faraday's law right here. So can I write this as d lambda by dt? And also as n times d5 by dt or how can I get that in terms of the B field? What's that? Let's assume again, we assume that positional variations don't exist here. So I would write that as what? So area N times A times DV by DT. Assuming the area is not changing as a function of time, I basically get that relationship right there. Okay. And so if I look at this and I take that into the phasor domain, all right, Joey's right. So I take that into the phasor domain, I get the voltage here. I want to be real careful because I am doing this relationship right here 
I'm doing this in, uh, well, let's, let me be in phaser domain. What do I typically imply? I imply that my, my phasers are in RMS. So help me take this guy N times A times DB by DT. Help me take that to the phaser domain. So I had V of T equals NA DB by DT. If I go to the phaser domain, what happens to that? NA is just NA. All right, so V of T is equal to N. Just focus on this expression right here. My voltage is equal to this, okay? But I have voltage is also equal to that, all right? How do I take this expression here into the phaser domain? V of T becomes a phaser. Ooh. What happens to the, you said it already, what happened to the D by DT? D by DT becomes a J omega. When I go to the phaser domain, right? So you have V equals L D I D T, right? In the phaser domain, that becomes voltage equals J omega L times I, like that, okay? Same thing happens here. I have V equals what? How would I write that? NA times what? J omega times B, yeah. So usually we put the J omega up front. So J omega times N A B. And I say whatever the phaser is for B. So in other words, what that does is it creates a B field. All right. Now, I guess I already labeled the voltage, but where is... How do these guys relate to each other? If this is the, the V and this is the B, what do I, why did I say this is V of T right here? And why did I say this is B of T? How did I know that V, first of all, is V leading or lagging? Is the voltage leading the B field or lagging the B field? V is leading it, has its peak, earlier how many how many degrees earlier 90 right now why do i know that because the j is there right if i add if i add the angles right i'd see the angle of v equals the angle of j which is what 90 degrees plus the angle of b all right all right, so we're going to use this. This is what happens typically in, in any real system, right? So what's that going to do? So I, I hook up, so if I hook up this guy right here to the grid, right? So I hook up the primary to 120 volts RMS, meaning peak value of 120 times square root of two, about 170 volts. <clears throat> There's going to be a current that goes into this thing. But what it's doing, if I put a voltage onto it, I'm creating a B field inside of the core on this guy. That's what I'm doing, all right? That B field, as a result, creates an H field, all right? That's the way we think about it. Basically, I'm imposing a flux onto this thing by hooking it up to a voltage, all right? So what is the current going to look like? Well, this is basically what happens. If I put a sinusoidal voltage onto it, then I get this sinusoidal flux, lambda of T which is basically N times A times B of T. The result of this curve here, that BH curve, is basically to make the current look super weird. Right now, the current basically looks really peaky. What's going on here? The current looks really peaky. If I think about what's going on as the, as the B field gets close to these peaks. What do we say the mu is doing? The, the, yeah, so mu is getting smaller. So mu relative is approaching one, right? So the reluctance we said is getting bigger. The L, which is N squared over the reluctance is getting smaller, okay? So if you think about this, this guy is an inductor. Right? So basically what I wrote there is when I have this circuit and I have V equals, just in terms of a circuit, if this guy has an L value and I, and I said to you, well, tell me how I get the current. 
how would I get the current? If this is L, this is V, how would I get I? Yeah, so V divided by J omega L. So think about that. If L gets smaller, so as I approach the peak of this, so my, as my B field gets bigger, my mu gets smaller. So let's see, as B goes up, mu goes down, the reluctance goes up, the L goes down. So what's going to happen to the I? It's going to get bigger. And so what, it, what I do is I get these really peaky, odd-looking things. All right, and it usually, this is what it actually sort of looks like. If I have a V of T that I put on this thing, the B field still looks kind of sinusoidal. And then the I of T looks, looks, looks awful is what it comes down to. That I of T looks like crap. And if I, so he's real peaky. All right. The other thing about him being, being peaky is also, this is not a linear system here, right? If I, if, is that a sine wave, that I of T? Uh, -uh. All right. I need a Fourier series to define that thing. And I, I don't, I, I don't want to talk about all the details on that, but that's where Fourier series would apply. That guy has all kinds of harmonics to him. All right. But I don't need to worry about that too much. Basically what I say is that that current is badly distorted, right? And that is exactly what the current looks like going into an unloaded transformer. Okay. When I say unloaded, what do I mean? When I say that, if I took this transformer here and this transformer was unloaded, what does that mean? Nothing on the secondary. Nothing on the secondary. All right. Once I put something on the secondary, the current will look nice and happy and sinusoidal again. All right. But this is this is what it looks like usually by default. All right. And so we I call that ultimately, I'm gonna come back to the slides there in a second, but I call this guy <clears throat> what I call the magnetizing inductance. All right, I don't want to skip too far ahead. I got some more stuff to talk about there. But I, I call the, the inductance of this core the magnetizer. That's just the name I give it, all right? <clears throat> now, there's a couple of other things. We, we already talked about this magnetic material. I said this guy has losses, all right? He's got two sources of loss. One of, well, there's, there's actually at least three, but the, the two major ones that I talk about. One of them is hysteresis loss. And the other one's called eddy current loss. So let's think about this, this thing, this hysteresis loss for a second. I'm going to go back to this picture. This, the fact that this, there's this weird BH relationship is causing these, these magnetic domains to move around. That's what I call hysteresis loss. All right. The fact that there is motion inside this thing. Now, the other thing that's true is I've got a B field or an H field, whatever I want to call it, moving through this material, right? So if I had this guy right here and I wrapped, you know, a winding around it, you guys said that the B field would go around in a circle, right? The th what's true about iron here? What, what kind of material is iron? Is it conductive or an insulator? It's conductive. Which means that by Faraday's law, if I put a B field into that thing, what's going to happen? There's a current, yeah, or a voltage that's going to flow inside of that thing. All right, so there is what I call, um, we call them eddy currents. Like if you talk about eddies in a, in a pool, right? Eddies, yeah, that's the basic principle, but yeah, that, that's used for a metal detector, yeah, is that you... You, you basically have some sort of a field that's created when you induce a current into the, the, the penny or whatever that you're you're looking for, right? Yeah, basically it's 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 inducing a current in in the metal on you, and it's pick it's got a receiver that's picking up what's being created. So it's putting out a magnetic field as they move this. It's basically inducing a current in your metal. Which it's it's got a receiver in that same wand that's picking that up, okay. So it's a, it's a useful property, right? People use it for a lot of things, but it, we call it an eddy current because basically there's currents that flow in little circles in, inside this thing. And I don't need to get into the details of that, but in order to make sure that those circles don't get to be very big, if you've ever seen a transformer, what it's done is it's usually made in laminations. In other words, it's got sheets of steel that are pushed together. All right, in fact, I so I brought um, 
Well, if you open this guy up, you would see that. But if I if I look at one of these, let's see, I've got all kinds of little pores here. Here's one. Go to the back here. You see there on the side, so there's those sheets. It's basically made in those sheets that are stamped and pressed together. We call those laminations, okay? And all magnetic materials are not all. Like the ferrite that I have isn't isn't done that way. So the ferrite, I guess maybe there's some sheets here, but usually like those pot cores, usually it's one consistent piece. For all 60 hertz power stuff, it's always like that, all right? Because they're usually pretty big, okay? So... I don't need to get into the whole microscopic details. We don't really care about that. What we care about is basically there is a loss associated with this thing. And I kind of summarize here a couple of things. So silicon steel, that's what I typically have for a 60 Hertz power application. All right. Now that's done in those laminations. So they're usually punched sheets. Okay. Uh, when I taught machines, I used to take them out to the plant where they made made motors and you'll see the motors are basically made in these punch steel sheets all right we say silicon steel because what they do is they dope this the steel with some silicon I mean they put some silicon into it why would they put silicon into it do you think why would they put another material into the steel it's not pure steel and the, and the thing that it does is it basically changes the conductivity of the steel it makes it more of an insulator. So it reduces its conductivity. So it reduces the losses inside of it, okay? So <clears throat> what I've written out here is basically the three types that you typically see. Like the one I, I gave you, again, problem two is something like this guy, right? Where it's, um, you know, a ferrite material, all right? Usually it's pretty low B field before it saturates, okay? The other guy here, basically the, with the laminations, um, that's still, he can usually get up to almost as much as two Tesla, right? You're not going to see much more than that in terms of Teslas or in terms of B fields that exist. All right. So let's look at where, I, where this would apply in sort of a real problem, right? Um, <clears throat> to do that, I want to think about um, basically how does this guy interact with the grid? What's the electric circuit model that I would have looking into those terminals, right? So from a physical picture, if I have windings on a core, right? That's what I have if I look at it physically. But I want to make a model for this to say, okay, well, if I put a voltage right here, V, and there's an I that goes into it. Well, it should make sense, right? This thing's a magnetic material. What do I obviously have to have looking into those terminals? Between those two electrical terminals, what electrical component should be there? An inductor, okay? There should definitely be an inductor. So if I have a voltage there's going to be a current, and I know that there's going to be an inductor. And this guy is what I call LM, or the magnetizing inductance. It results from magnetizing that core. Okay. Now, I've also said that there are losses inside of that core. right? And what I do is I put a core loss resistance to model the effect of that right there. That's not a script R, that's a capital, which is a regular English R, right? This is my core loss. All right, and this is my magnetizing inductance. Now there's one other thing that I should probably include. There's at least, there's at least two things that I should include, but there's one other resistance I should include here. What other resistance should I include? This is the losses of the core. This is from those magnetic domains flipping around in those eddy currents. What else should be here? What other losses should I have? Resistance from, from where? Not from air. The wire, the copper wire, right? There's resistance to that wire. Now that's, we're gonna add that later. It would be in series with this, right? Because I can basically add a resistor in series to model what the wire is going to do. Okay. So we'll get to that later. For now, I'll keep it, keep it simple. This is what I have from, from the, the sort of the saturation effect and the core losses. I have this. All right. And typically, and I give you, I gave you values off of a chart like this in the homework. All right. 
I said the units get weird. They mix them and match them. They do they do English units and and SI units together. So what this is is basically saying the B field for in in watts and volt amps per pound. All right. So in other words, if I figure out how many pounds of, of the steel that I have, and this is done for a typical steel that I would have in a transformer, M19 steel. M19 is the is the magnetic grade. All right. And 29 gauge. Gauge is how you measure steel thicknesses, right? So this is so somebody measured what's called the power loss density. So this guy here is power in units of watts per pound. All right. And why would they do it that way? Well, because you buy the material and you, you figure out how many pounds of the stuff do I need to make my make my inductor and my transformer. All right. And they give you a volt amps per pound. All right. And you use those in problem three on the homework. All right. That's pretty straightforward. I don't allow that to, to intimidate you. Then that's fairly straightforward. And we'll, let's do an example. All right. So let's say I got a toroidal core. All right. And that toroid looks a lot like this one here, right? So if I if I show this one again on the dot cam, maybe, right? So he's round. He's also kind of cross-sectionally, he's kind of rectangular, all right? And that's just like the problem I have here. He's gonna be rectangular and cross-section. All right, so I'm told, this guy has an average length of 471 millimeters. So that's basically the length around this thing right here. Um, that is basically the length here. It's just like we said before, don't get lost in that. Usually I'm going to tell you here's the length. Right, because no one cares. They usually say the R is much, much greater than the width of that thing, in which case the assumption is that everything is basically sitting at the center. So it's a circumference going around it. I'm not even making you do the geometry. I told you that it's it's 471 millimeters around. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and it's 30 millimeters by 50 millimeters. It has that length, and I apply a voltage of 115 volts to this thing. And the material is such that the maximum flux density is 1.5 Tesla. So what does that mean? The maximum flux density is 1.5 Tesla. What happens that above that? Saturates. Above that, it saturates. And the core loss density of this guy is in is five watts per kilogram. Okay, so if I have a kilogram of material, there's five watts of loss in it. That's what that says. All right, so, all right. And I'm told that the current has a peak value of 1.8. Now, when I'm talking phasers, this that means this is RMS. All right. And this guy here is RMS. I want to find the maximum number of turns on this guy. I want to find the power. I want to find RC and I want to find LM. So back to this picture, I want to find RC and LM. Okay. All right. I'm going to start with the number of turns. Okay. So what did we say? We said that the voltage V of T was equal to L di dt, right? Right, for the, for the inductor at least, or that this is equal to D lambda by dt. Okay, so D lambda by dt. So when we plugged in the fact that this was N times A times dB by dt, we ended up with this relationship here in phasers. We said V equals... Help me make that a phasor relationship again. J omega N A times whatever the, the value of B is. Okay. Now, I'm solving for N. Okay. Help me solve for N. How would I do that here? Yeah. Right, so if I if I push this guy as I always do, I try to push him right up to saturation. So I basically say I, I I'm I'm going to apply this 115 volts RMS, and I can't allow my B field to go any bigger than 1.5 Tesla. Okay, so I got to be careful. I got to do this in peak values, right? So what I end up saying is this guy becomes square root of two times the RMS value of the voltage 
and I'm, I'm going to do this in magnitudes. If I do this in magnitudes over here, how do I, what happens when I take the magnitude of J omega N A times B? Yeah, so this, this is RMS here. And if I do it in magnitudes, or maybe I should say peak values, right? This becomes omega N A times, I, I guess I'll say it as 1.5 Tesla. Like that. Well, no, it's not to say. It's to say if I if I have that voltage and I want to ensure that that voltage is using the the inductor as best it can, then it should basically push it right up to the saturation point, right? In other words, what if I don't do that without getting into too much details? I'm basically using too big of an inductor ultimately, all right, or too too big of a core. So I push it right up to that limit, all right? So I can solve for n here. So n becomes the square root of two times the magnitude of V divided by omega times A of the core times 1.5. All right, now what do I plug in for omega? Two pi 60. I didn't say clearly that it was 60 Hertz. You can always check with me if I haven't said that, but I won't give you a European thing typically. It's gonna be two pi 60. Okay. This works out to be 407. And one thing to be to be clear about, if you get 407.6, n needs to be an integer. I can't do 0. 0.6 of a turn, right? So I just, it's 408 at that point. Okay, that's that's the way we typically think of turns. All right. Um, just from a practical perspective, you can't have a fractional turn on a on a core. Right. It really doesn't matter that much if you round up or round down typically. All right. So there's 407 turns that I can fit onto this guy. Now, I want to find the core loss. That means I want to find the power loss in this thing. So I want to find a power in watts. Okay. What was I told that'll help me find that power loss in watts? What's that? Um, well, I don't I don't have a resistance or anything yet to what else do I have here though? I have this core loss density. I have this power in units of watts per kilogram, right? So I have let's see. So big P in watts is P times the mass M of this thing. So this is watts per kilogram. This guy would be kilograms. All right, now here's something that you won't remember. I didn't write this down in, in, in my my factors here, but um, in this case, I have I was told that this is five watts per kilogram. Now, what do I need to figure out the mass of this thing? I need the density, yeah, and what else? How do I get from, if I know a density, how do I get to a mass? A volume and a density gives me a mass, right? So basically I need the density. Now it turns out I looked up what the density was, which is 7,760, 7, this is for steel, for that type of steel, 7,760 um, kilograms per meter cubed. Now I get the volume of this guy. How do I get the volume of this guy? I, yeah, so I could I could get real geometric on it and get real careful and say it's got a cross-sectional area and an inner diameter and outer diameter, but basically I can say it's the length times the cross-sectional area. That's close enough, typically. If if you tried to do it real carefully and some of you guys like to be anal, all right, that's okay. It's just going to turn out that you're going to be even closer, but more or less get the same answer, all right? If I do that, I plug in all those numbers, this guy's going to work out to 27.4 watts. Okay. Now, how does that relate to this picture right here? How does that relate to this picture? So, basically, we're saying is the 115 volt source was right here. 
Okay. That resistor dissipates 27.4 watts, right? So power in a resistor, how does that relate to what I know? B squared over R, right? So I know that it's particularly the magnitude squared divided by R, right? So this is 100 and so if I, if I rewrite this to solve for R, right? I have 27.4 equals 115 squared divided by R sub C. My R sub C works out to be what? Uh, what do I get? 483 ohms. That's what I get. 483 ohms. Okay. All right. So now I have that. Next thing I want to do is I want to figure out what the L is, the magnetizing inductance. Okay. And I can't do this by saying in this particular case, well, it's N squared over the reluctance because what do I know? The reluctance is changing, right? So in other words, at this condition, I want to use circuit analysis to figure out what that L sub M is, okay? Let's go back to what I know now, okay? So I know that the peak value of the current is 1.8 amps RMS. I know the voltage is 115 volts. And I know the power is, what do we say, 27.4 watts, okay? So I want to figure out L sub M. And I know that the power is 27.4 watts. I know that this current has a magnitude of 1.8 amps. I know that this voltage has a magnitude of 115 volts. So help me out. How can I figure out what this impedance is? I think, um, I, I could figure out the current through that thing. I could. Um, that gets a little tricky here because I don't. Um, that's one way to do it. Let me put that one. All right. I think there's another way. I want to think about this in terms of, of what do I know about the power? How does the power relate? So the power coming into this thing, again, we're told it's 27.4 watts. How does that relate to the voltage and current at the terminals? It's not quite just V times I in this case. V times I times the power factor. Right, so this guy would be, because we're talking about AC stuff, we're saying this guy is V times I times cosine of whatever the impedance angle is, right? The power factor is the cosine of the impedance angle, okay? And I know, I was told that this guy was 115 volts. And I was told this current was 1.8. So I can solve for cosine of phi Z from that. So I can solve for the power factor. So the power factor, PF, which is the cosine of phi Z, works out to be really bad. Well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. I should have asked you guys if it was bad. All right, this guy works out to be 0 0.132, or sometimes we would say 13.2%. All right, that's, that's really, really bad. All right. Not uncommonly bad, though, for something like this, which is kind of a small inductor. It's like my doorbell, right? This this is probably not too bad for that, or not unexpected. All right, so now from that, how can I now figure out what the L value is? Well, I can also figure out the magnitude of the total impedance here, right? What's the magnitude of the total impedance? Or I got a couple of ways to do this. I can also figure out the Q value, right? How do I figure out the Q value? Yeah. Magnitude of V times the magnitude of I times the sine of phi, like that, right? And that's gonna end up giving me 
because I can figure out what phi z is. So phi z, if I'd solved for it from here, worked out to be 82.4 degrees. Okay. How can I relate this to the impedance? Well, we know that V squared, we said the magnitude of V squared over what? The imaginary part of the impedance, which is that XM like that. So from there I can solve for it. Okay. <clears throat> That's the basic approach that you would take in, in a problem like this, all right? So just so we're clear too, I mean, if I, if I drew the phasor diagram and everything, the voltage would be here. Where would the current be? So where's I relative to V? Lagging, and it's lagging by how much? 82 degrees, right? This would be an 82 degree difference. All right. So um, the only other thing that you're really kind of given to worry about in the first part of the homework is you're given kind of a typical data sheet, all right? Mm -hmm. So one thing that I, I, Cody, I saw your message in the chat and I was imagining you with a ruler trying to, to, to look at this guy. Uh, and you're not the first person to do it, and you won't be the last. So you're in good company. All right. If you notice what you're given here, this is the typical way they do it. They give you an effective length and they give you an effective area. So ultimately, you're going to say the, the reluctance of the core is related to those two things. Now, the one thing to remember is this is an E core. To make a full core, I got to put one E on top of the other E. Right. So that, that makes an implication about the length. It needs to be twice this value. Right. Now, what you end up doing I, and later in that problem is you put it, you, we, we say we grind out, literally grind out 250 micrometers of uh, micrometers, uh, a gap. All right. And the gap typically would be sort of in the center leg. So I grind it down a little bit. Okay. And what that gives me is a core that looks like this. So how would that change? The magnetic circuit. Well, I've got a core and I got a gap. And I'm sure Cody and the others that you guys are very well trained to be very, very exact. I know that. Right. So this is a little uncomfortable, but do I need to change the length of the core by 250 mic micrometers? No, I don't. I can just assume it's the same reluctance of the core. It's not going to change it much. Okay. You could do it. It's just going to be not worth the, the juice will not be worth the squeeze. All right. To, to do that. All right. The, just assume it's the same core and you've added that gap to it. And you can do, you should, I mean, you should do that. Maybe prove it to yourself, right? It's, it is worth doing that. What does that do? All right. So basically this is what I showed before. I showed the BH curve. Well, what I can also show because H comes from the MMF. Phi comes from the B field. So what I've shown here is B versus, I, I've shown B versus NI, right? So this is specifically MMF, and this is phi. Up here, B sat times the area of the core. That's the maximum flux I can take. So basically what it says is the maximum current I can put in there is N times whatever is going to saturate this thing. So this is what I have here. This line represents core only. This guy here represents core and gap. Now, what do I notice about this guy right here in terms of how much current I can push through it if I have a gap? What's true about this here versus that? Which one has the higher current? The one with the gap has a higher current. All right. So what that what that does is essentially uh, allows me to be able to, in the same core, carry more current without saturating it. Okay. Typically, what that means is I, I can I can use that same inductor, all right, to carry a heck of a lot more energy than I would have otherwise. It's got a lower inductance, but a heck of a lot more current. Well, what's the energy in an inductor? One half, One half Li squared. So if the I can be tripled, how much energy? Well, I, 
raise it to the power of nine or not the power of nine, nine times, right? So, so that's, that's particularly important to me when I'm designing in power electronics and stuff like that. The inductor I give you there in problem two is a very typical power electronics inductor, right? Where I'm trying to design something into a little power supply or something like that, okay? All right, <clears throat> we will pick up uh, on Wednesday with transformers. I will make one announcement right now. I'm gonna push the homework back to Monday. Um, I was hoping to get into a little bit of inductors, but I, I, or sorry, a little bit of transformers, but I'm gonna wait till Wednesday to do that. Yeah, you can't